Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella nailed it when he said, quote, Moglia rightly refocuses us on the people, not just the algorithms and machines behind the next wave of artificial intelligence, end quote. Of course, he was talking about Bob Moglia, former CEO of Snowflake and a real trailblazer in our industry. In this episode, we find out what Moglia has been working on with author Steve Hamm as they promote their new book, The Datapreneurs, The Promise of AI and the Creators Building Our Future. The future is here already. It's just not evenly distributed. Yet. Today's world teams with innovation. The nexus of hardware, software, and human ingenuity promises a revolution in possibilities. What does tomorrow look like? Witness Future Proof. Truly, Eric Cavanaugh here with a very special show today, folks, and a very special guest. We're going to be talking to Bob Muglia, the former CEO of Snowflake and an all-around innovator in our industry for many, many years. And he's got a new book along with Steve Hamm, a book called The Datapreneurs, The Promise of AI and the Creators Building Our Future. And, uh, you know, I'm sitting here in Gibsonia, Pennsylvania. And I'm uh, inclined to come up with a great quote from one of my personal heroes, someone I follow and, and learn from, William Gibson, who was a futurist. And he had a great quote where he said, the future is here already, it's just not evenly distributed. And I was like, holy Christmas, what kind of a quote is that? And what he means is that there are pockets of innovation. There are pockets like in cities, for example, where you have more cell phones and cell towers and 5G, more laptops and iPads and things of this nature. And then you go way out to the country and maybe not so much. You have more factory equipment, for example, or mills or mines or different things of this nature. And it's a different story. But you do have these pockets of innovation. Of course, it also means the past is all around us as well, right? It's not just the future. But what's cool about the time we're in right now is that this is a very significant changing of the guard, if you will. You look at what artificial intelligence is now doing, and it's not new. We've had AI for 40, 50 years. The term's been around for a long time. The algorithms, some of them have been around for a long time. But what we didn't have was the compute. What we didn't have was the data to train these algorithms. And we didn't have the the force of business to push it through. And now we certainly do. So we've kind of seen these worlds of data management and artificial intelligence and machine learning really start to coalesce in the last few years. And then of course, ChatGPT rolled out their large language model, which is blowing minds. And then a couple of companies did too, Google, even Databricks rolled out a large language model in fairly short order after ChatGPT hit the scene. And there were some strange things in the news, uh, like the New York Times having a reporter talk to the ChatGPT and it told him to leave his wife and all this crazy stuff. But I would argue that was a misuse of the technology. You shouldn't be trying to tease weird answers out of a large language model. It's there to reflect back the knowledge that is extant in the world today. And it can do so in a grammatically correct, syntactically compelling sort of way. It can write proposals, it can write tweets, it can write articles and blogs and all sorts of different things. It does hallucinate. It does come up with stuff because it's really just parsing little fragments of content that it's found somewhere else on the web. So there are lots of interesting things to get into around all that. But today we wanted to help Bob promote his new book. I've really learned about the, the impetus behind this and understand more about what makes Bob tick. So with that, Bob Moglia, welcome to Inside Analysis. Congrats on your book. I think it's very exciting. I'm looking over it over the weekend. Uh, it must feel good to put that to bed and begin the promotion process, right? It does feel good. It's been a lot of work. Uh, I've been working on it for a couple of years. Uh, when Steve and I started on this, the, you know, the really idea was is that I had some things I wanted to say. I thought there's some things I could help teach people um, from my career. And I wanted to say it in a way that was uh, easy for people to read and enjoyable. And so we came up with the idea of talking about technology and the advances in data from the perspective of the entrepreneurs of data, the people who have made it happen really over the last 40 years. And I've had the incredible fortune to be able to work with quite a number of these folks. And so we wanted to highlight those folks, the so-called datapreneurs. We were able to quickly shorten the name from the, the data entrepreneurs to the datapreneurs, a little bit catchier, I hope. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and to, to highlight their work, starting you know really in the early days of SQL, uh, the early days of databases, 
um, going through the, the internet era, the, the work that was done at Microsoft around information at your fingertips, and then all of the advancements that we've seen in the modern data stack in the last 10 years. And when we started the book, uh, really we knew that, that, you know, I knew that machine learning was, was making a significant amount of changes in the world. I saw that it was having an impact. It was working with new types of data that we couldn't work on before. Uh, for example, images or videos, those were, it was always data that was relatively opaque to computers, hard to mm -hmm. work with. All of a sudden this machine learning was beginning to crack it. Um, but we really, I, I did not realize how fast this stuff was going to advance, to be honest. I was, I think like, like most of the colleagues I know have been caught a little bit flat footed by the speed of advancement uh, that we've seen in the last 18 months. And I continue to be uh, kind of blown away by how fast the, the, the innovation is happening right now. Well, sure. And, you know, what's really cool here, and I'll try to keep the focus on the people and the technology, is that people use technology, right? They're, they're, yeah. I look at the, the the media in general and the mainstream media, and I'm a huge media fan. I'm in the media, obviously. We can learn a lot from the media, but I've got one of these mantras I throw out there to people that the narrative is always wrong. And what I mean by that is the narrative, by definition, is a story. And so it's going to have some flair to it and some embellishment, for example. But for some reason, the narrative just gets off track and it's hard to get it back on track. And what I'm talking about here is the narrative that AI is the red eyed robot that's going to take over the world and all this stuff. And it, it's just not the case. I mean, there, I don't think these large language models are going to take over the world anytime soon. But the key is to understand the technology and know how to use it, know how to leverage it for your business. And that's where the magic happens. So just this morning, I was talking to one of our partners, Eve Mulkers from 7W Data. You've met him before in one of our webinars. And he said what he's learned about ChatGPT, these large language models, is you have to be very explicit when telling it what you want. So it's just like a requirements document. You're kind of going through the process, yeah. telling I want A, but not B and not C, but D and not E and not F, and give it to me in this style. And the, the closer you can get to articulating the policy, if you will, which is the prompt, the better results you're gonna get from the technology. And that's true across the board, understanding how to use the technology and then doing it correctly, that's what leads to big success, right? Absolutely, and right now, people are doing a lot of that prompt engineering to help to get the more advanced models like GPT-4, GPT-35 to do exactly what they want. And you know, we'll see more of that over time as, as these things become more sophisticated. The newer models are starting to do things like allowing you to uh, begin to reason. They actually have reasoning capabilities. It's, it's pretty amazing to start to see that computers can do the, the, something that's a higher order intelligence that, that have, has always been reserved for humans. And even starting to be able to do simple planning. The planning isn't as advanced as, as it will be in the next few years, but they're starting to do that. The other thing that's fascinating, and this is, I mean, I think is, is, is one of the most incredible things that's happened in the last two months, is there's a veritable Cambrian explosion of, mm. of uh, open source development happening with, of, with people really all across the world contributing to, to improve the algorithmic structure of models, to allowing, allow models to run on much smaller computers, um, to be inference without having these big data centers behind them so they could actually run in portable systems, uh, being able to run with much less memory and much and use a lot less power um, and just be much more efficient in general. Now, those models are not yet as sophisticated as the bespoke models like a GPT-4 is, but the, the improvement that we've seen in the last three months is pretty remarkable. And a lot of organ companies are taking advantage of this. And one of the things that I think has been answered, and this was not clear, like four or five months ago is, you know, will this technology be something that is available? Is it a new digital divide going to be created with this technology? Right. Will it only be available to, to, this, this, to the elite few? And wow. I think it's pretty clear that the cost of intelligence is going to rapidly move to as close to zero. The cost of this artificial intelligence will go down substantially so it will be accessible to pretty much everybody, which I think is incredibly good. I, I think it's, a, it, I was worried 
if we were going to be in a situation where the development of these large language models and advanced artificial intelligence was going to be kept within a handful of companies. Sure. I think it's far, far better if we have a large number of these things being created. You know, it's funny you should say all that because I'm always trying to explain things to my wife and friends and other folks. And I brought up exactly what you just said. I said the one danger would be if there is some way that a handful of corporations which have access to these technologies, think quantum, think IBM with access to these quantum machines. And something a lot of people don't understand is that's gonna be a very, very disruptive development when those when those machines go mainstream, right? Or at least theoretically they will be. I was talking to a guy from Harman Kardon the other day at the Click World conference, and he was pointing out that when this stuff goes mainstream, when quantum goes mainstream, all of the cryptography falls sideways. Like you'll be able to hack into any kind of system anywhere. So well, what does that mean? But I think you're right that it is, and, and open source is the reason why. You know, I'm a huge open source fan. From the moment I er learned what it was about, I did a whole bunch of research. This is back in 2005. And I remember at the time, the Apache web server had just eclipsed the Internet Explorer, whatever it was called, the, the Microsoft oh, uh, I, web server. It was server. called Internet Explorer. It was called Internet Explorer. So. <laughs> okay, so well, I got it right. IIS, IIS, Internet Information Server, was the <laughs> web server. That's right. And Apache passed them. And I thought to myself, and at the time I was studying service-oriented architecture and thinking to myself, wait a minute, the nexus of open source as a methodology, as a discipline, and SOA, this spells trouble for the traditional closed source big box vendors like the Oracles and the SAPs of the world. What's going to shake out of all this? And it took about nine years longer than I thought. But then all of a sudden I looked around and there are all these open source vendors everywhere. There's a whole stack built for data. Of course, the whole Hadoop thing we've talked about in the past and, and of Apache Spark and all these different things. And it really fundamentally changed the game about how software is de developed and produced and managed. And I think it became a much more collegial environment, which is good for all of us. What do you think? Well, I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan of open source. I, it's interesting because my background, of course, was a Microsoft background. And certainly in the old days, Microsoft wasn't that open to open source. <laughs> right. uh, that That's was right. certainly true. Although I felt like I was always on the other side of that of that particular battle. That was one that Steve and Bill held fairly close to. You know, they had some very strong feelings about yes. proprietary <laughs> software. And I yes. think that was expressed a number of times. I, I was generally speaking on the other side of that, although I built you know, it was funny because you mentioned I, in, Internet Information Server. That was my product, and I watched it get killed. <laughs> oh, um, no. <laughs> uh, largely because we had a security funny. vulnerability that just, to you, could see, you could see the trajectory totally change when Microsoft was attacked, our software was attacked, and how all of a sudden it, it became something that almost nobody wanted to use at that point. Wow. However, but the general trend towards the Internet using open source was one that was inexorable, and, and certainly we've seen. It took Microsoft a long time, for example, to, to give up their proprietary browser and move to Chromium as, a sta as an open source browsing alternative. You know, the engine inside, inside Edge is now essentially the same engine it's inside Chrome. And, and that just means that open source has won that battle. Yeah. It's interesting. The language battle is not yet understood. I don't think that there is clarity in the industry is what's going to happen. Certainly, if you talk to the Microsoft folks or the OpenAI folks, they will continue to say that that building uh, bespoke sort of proprietary models that are very that are built with very very large amounts of compute uh, that that's going to continue to be a way of staying ahead. Hmm. Uh, I think they still they, they believe that they certainly have believed that, and certainly they've achieved they've achieved uh, the preeminent model through that approach. Um, you know, OpenAI has demonstrated uh, that uh, that larger that by building very large models, you know, we you know to with GPT-4 roughly you know, we don't know exactly, but roughly a trillion parameters in that model, it can take on and do some things that 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 other models can't do. But it's fascinating because the techniques that are being developed are really quite significant in the open source community, and I think they're going to have to have an impact on the Googles and the opening eyes and the metas of the world as they continue to develop their large their large models. Having having uh, big companies spend money to, to, to on compute to build the fundamental language foundation in these models is going to be somewhat necessary for a while, although there is open source solutions being built, just, just open sourcing all the data and everything else. Right. Um, 
but it I do I do think there'll be a balance of these things. Uh, Meta did some really good things by by releasing their model to the to the research community, and then everything wound up leaking to the open source community. And essentially, that's what really set off this this advancement in the open source world. But again, I think it's a great thing. I think it's a great thing to see lots of models developing. Uh, as I work with companies that are that are are uh, innovating in the the in artificial intelligence natural language space. You know, I do see people using a mixture of these models. GPT-4 is still the best if you're working with more complex sorts of, of questions. But if you if you're if the problem you're trying to solve is more specific, these these uh, open source models are actually achieving equal quality to GPT-4 in more isolated cases, and they do so at a fraction of the compute compute cost, which means they're they're you know cheaper to run and and just generate less carbon. These mm -hmm. models could generate a lot of carbon potentially. Um, they're 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 using a lot of compute horsepower right now. Well, and and one nice thing about open source is that we can all collaborate on building foundations such that individual companies and people can then finish off their last mile, which is what makes their company special. And if you collaborate around the foundation, you can tackle a lot of really basic issues that become encumbrances otherwise, like just being able to move data from place to place, being able to connect, you know, the networking side of equations. There are so many foundational components to compute, which if standardized and open sourced, will allow us to really focus on that last mile of innovation that makes us special. What do you think? I totally agree. And, and again, I think we're seeing that happen given the advancement and the, and the very rapid innovation that's happened literally since February. I mean, we're just right. talking like three months. It's ridiculous. Right. Right. And and seeing the sets of fundamental changes that are coming out, you know, reducing the time to train. I mean, to give you an example, one of the companies I work with, Dakigami, is, uses their own model uh, to, to, to pull data out of business contracts. And for them and their customers, they want to, they don't want to send, their customers don't want to send all the data up to OpenAI and have it run through GPT-4. Right. They want to keep that more, more proprietary. And they also don't want to deal with any kind of hallucinations on this. Right. So the models, the models that they're using are, are, are tuned and focused on working directly with customer information exclusively and focused on only pulling data out of the customer documents. In other words, they don't imagine something. They don't make anything up. back here on Inside Analysis. Yes, take us to the future indeed. That's what AI is doing right now. It's taking us to the future, a future in which we can get a lot more done. This is a new tool, these AI engines, they're new tools that we can leverage. The large language models, of course, are getting all the headlines. That's not the only form of artificial intelligence out there. But, you know, I did have a thought as you were talking, we're talking to Bob Muglia, uh, who has a new book that is out right now. Very cool stuff. I took a look at it over the weekend. The Datapreneurs, The Promise of AI, and The Creators Building Our Future. And you know what I thought though, that's quite interesting and, uh, and ironic, perhaps, Bob, is that this AI power is going to do two things simultaneously. One, it's going to make, of course, deepfakes much easier. But two, I think it is, if implemented properly, going to effect much greater transparency. These are two different things, right? What is real and what is fake are two different things. It's good at creating the fake stuff, but I think it's also going to be good at generating transparency such that we have trust in what we're looking at. What do you think about that? Well, I think it's going to force us to to work together in a lot of, in a lot of different ways than we have ever worked before. It'll do stuff. It's going to do. I think in the short run, what AI will do is it's going to help automate the types of tasks that that people don't really enjoy doing, and aren't. I mean, sometimes they're not all that good at doing because they're repetitive tasks, and 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 people just get bored doing them. So we'll see a lot of improvement in the way businesses work. I think almost every application will change in the next three to five years to incorporate AI. Uh, honestly, from my perspective, it's the largest and most significant thing that's happened in technology in my lifetime. I think the fact that all of a sudden we have computers that can parse and really in some senses understand English in, in any language, not just English, any native language, really. They're quite good at all. It's quite good at all of them. And, and, uh, and be able to communicate with us in a much more natural way. I, I, I think we, we finally have broken through and and we'll start to see the new applications coming out. Uh, certainly in the in the productivity space, 
uh, in the space of, of office workers. Uh, I think that that's an area where we didn't necessarily expect to see as much change, but because of the attributes of these language models, uh, people can be more effective. We've already seen it improve developers and developer productivity markedly. I mean, we GitHub is finding that 40% of their code that's, that is checked in by people who are using GitHub Copilot are written by Copilot. Wow. That's crazy. These are crazy improvements that we just, you know, I wouldn't have expected and is now quite, quite available to people. Yeah. And that's a big deal. So I've been reading about Copilot and, you know, I've been seeing for in, in Google for about two years now, I noticed when if you were in the Gmail client, just typing an, an email to someone, all of a sudden a recommendation would come to finish your sentence. And I was like, holy Christmas, that was the early indicator. It was the early the indicator. Right. And so Google's been working on this. Lots of people have been working on it. Then, of course, OpenAI rolls this out. And that was the big gong splash to kind of wake the world up. But uh, you know, this is all sort of part and parcel to what you're calling the arc of data innovation. Right. And right. It, and I'm a data guy. I've been a data guy for 23 years and counting now in terms of really focusing on the industry. And as you kind of map the evolution of functionality, automation, AI, and now, of course, these large language models, you can see it's it's very quickly becoming logarithmic in a way, right? It, Where it's, it goes like this and then it just shoots And that's up. why the arc does that. It, it, it goes lo logarithmic. And, and that's a really interesting question, which is where is it going to go in the next 20 years? Mm -hmm. If you look back, I mean, this didn't start, this didn't start a year or two ago. I mean, this idea of building in assistance, this idea of using some form of artificial intelligence has been around for a long time. And certainly working on data and treating data as an important resource for organizations to work with. I mean, that goes back certainly to the 1960s for sure. And the earliest databases that were created back then. Uh, but, but these pieces have built on each other and there's been a long set of people that have helped make it happen. You know, we saw the internet come about and, and the transition that, that that created. The fact that that text, I mean, when I think about data, there's different kinds of data. There's structured data that you might work with in a SQL database. There's semi-structured data, which takes, which is often stored in a format called JSON, and it's mm -hmm. more hierarchical, and it's it's used to report, typically, the, the operations that are done by internet and cloud systems. Uh, but a very large amount of the data in the world is is it written the written word in text, and we've seen how powerful that can be in working with these large language models. But what I find just as interesting is, is that beyond text, we're creating as, as a society a massive amount of information in other formats, particularly video, but audio, um, and then of course taking text and making them into more complicated documents that have precise meanings associated with them. All of these things are, are complex sources of data. Sometimes people call uh, audio or video unstructured data. I prefer to call it complex data because that's really what it is. It's it's not unstructured. There's lots that's of right. structure inside right. that data. It's that's just that right. that structure is so complicated that's that right. computers have not been able to understand it. Now that's an interesting point we could understand it as people but computers couldn't if you took i mean if you used you know a digital camera circa 2003 and you took a picture of a horse eating hay in a barn you could show that to a four-year-old and they can identify what that picture is wow. but it only it is only with an advent advent of these neural networks that have really come in since the early 2010s in that period where we start to have algorithms that can begin to identify and work with the contents of complex data. I mean, that's where we're, where we're getting things. And that's certainly where we things like, see things like stable diffusion and, and Dolly, all of those things are example of language models that are also working with images, this, this interesting form of complex data. And, and we'll see that in video certainly shortly. Well, yeah, and of course, business needs are going to drive what gets done next, right? I mean, I think we just saw with Facebook this huge experiment with the metaverse. I looked at that from the early days and thought, this is Roblox for adults or what's going on here exactly? And there were some very clever enterprise level thoughts that went into this and how you could leverage this. But I think it just got a bit off track and it wound up being a bit of a 
learning experience for one of the biggest companies in the world. And it goes to show you that you do need to have a business focus in mind when you leverage these technologies. You need to know what you're trying to accomplish and then be realistic about tracking. You know, I've thought of, not to, to get political in any way, but I've thought to myself about in the political world, every two years we get to elect a new representative, every four years a president, every six years a senator. It's a pretty long period of time to go without having a check and balance. In the business world, we don't get that kind of luxury. I mean, we can think we have two years and then bad every things quarter, happen. We have every six quarter months. at the very least. You have a reporting. You have a reporting every quarter at the very least, and hopefully, you're looking at things a lot more frequently than that. Sure. I wish the government would do that too. That's another. I, that's another story. Well, we got another show. We'll talk about that. I've got some ideas. We can get into the weeds about that. But I think there is a good conversation to be had in the tremendous value that these algorithms can have. Look at healthcare, for example, and being able to scan millions and millions of MRIs and, and detect patterns and ascertain different developments and drug discoveries and things. Or going nature. through drug discovery. That's another example where the ability to, to look at this. Plus, I mean, the advancements that are made in, in actually understanding protein folding, which for the first time we can, you know, scientists and, and biologists can really understand how, how, how some of these compounds will work. And, and how they will react in, when they're put inside a, a human body or any kind of organism. It's, it's, it's a new world in terms of the types of applications that can be built. I think one of the way I tend to think about this is that, that there's, there's, I sort of split this into sort of two set of sets. There's, there's AI as a tool that people will use. And then there's AI eventually and its evolution on its own and, and where it, it's going, you know, how will it evolve and, and change over time? We're, we're, that second one is still somewhat in the future. We're still in the future because these AIs are, have really not reached to the point where they are continuously learning and continuously growing. They're much more batch oriented. They're very early in their incarnation. Mm -hmm. I do, however, believe they're going to get smarter and they're going to continue to get smarter over time. And so we have to think about how we will guide this AI as it continues to evolve and get smarter, potentially getting smarter than we are. And 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 want that to be we want that to 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 be a a cooperative agent in our society and to work mm -hmm. with us and together. Mm -hmm. In the short run, the thing that's more interesting is, is how will people use AI? And here the interesting observation I have is that is that for every tool created since the beginning of time, mankind has used it for every possible purpose. Yeah. Good, bad, and evil. Okay, and and people will first and foremost use AI for good. And there's a there's a thousand, a million ways in which we can apply AI to society to help people live their lives and lead more productive and, and better lives. There are also ways where you can use AI for bad and and for evil purposes. I mean, amongst the most extreme of those are killer ro the idea of building killer robots that right. that are essentially drones of some type that that potentially cooperate and work together and you know go off and 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 perform damage and kill people those are to me those are weapons of mass destruction and we need to think about it in that sense and we need to make sure that 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 as people begin to use ai for nefarious purposes for example spamming i mean that's a, an example where almost certainly we will see ai being applied as smarter phishing sites and spamming sites, et cetera. Right. But we'll also see AI applied to fight that too, which is the mm -hmm. good news. I mean, that that's people, this is a case where people are using whatever tools are at their disposal, but all people have these tools. And as I say, you can use it for evil, but you can use it for good. And you can also use it for preventative purposes. And AI is an incredible tool in helping to find spammers and, 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 to, and discover these things and to shut them down. Yeah. And this is where I come back to. This is where I come back to. To you know, my uh, my sort of science fiction icon, uh, who I really consider to be an, a prophet in so many ways, which is Isaac Asimov, and what he was saying over 50 years ago, actually 70 years ago, in the 1940s and the 1950s, when he envisioned a world of robotics. It was Asimov that coined the term robotics, and the reason why that term is important is because. It's it's this it's the term really means using using machines as tools, robot machines as tools for people. 
it's they are they're engineered to be used for people and that's why asimov invented the laws of robotics you know the first law being a, a robot will not harm a human or allow a human being to come to harm the second law being that a, a robot will behave and will will, will 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 follow a human being and follow the orders of a human being as long as it doesn't violate the first law and the third law being it can protect a robot can protect itself as long as it doesn't violate the first two laws